we're going to be talking about effective Scala, which is a fun, fun thing. So, who am I? Why should you listen to me? Well, I am a software engineer. I've done a lot of Scala over the years. I'm also a blogger, an author, and a nerd. But more importantly, according to Klaus, I'm a unicorn expert. <laughs> so, reasons why you should listen to this talk. Now, all right. <coughs> so first, let's talk about what is Scala. What is effective Scala, right? We want to optimize our use of Scala to solve real-world problems without explosions, broken thumbs, and bullet wounds, right? So, in any language, you can write terrible code. Scala does not prevent you from writing terrible code. That's not the kind of language it's designed to be. It's designed to help you write really, really elegant code, right? But in so doing, you could potentially um, write terrible code if you wanted. We don't stop you, okay? <coughs> so effective Scala is trying to write nice, elegant code, avoiding pitfalls, knowing where they are, and uh, succeeding in your daily work. So <coughs> let's start with a few basics, okay? By the way, this talk is going to be a whole lot of different concepts and a whole lot of, hey, maybe you should go look that up somewhere else because I can't talk about it in 45 minutes. All right? So just bear with me here. It's gonna, there's, there's a few of these. All right, first off, in Scala, this is, this is the most basic principle, right? Expressions, not statements. In everything, Scala is an expression, right? Everything in Scala is an expression. Everything returns a value. You can make use of this. Here's some code. It's imperative, right? I want to get an error message for a given error code, all right? I create a ver result. I match over my error code, assign to the result, and at the end, I return it. What does that look like? Java. It, we're not Java, OK? What we can do in Scala, bam, don't do that. That was explosions, right? <coughs> what we can do in Scala is we don't even need that extra um, <coughs> curly brace, right? We, we don't need all of that setup. We just have a single simple function that is one expression. When you get into the, the uh, groove of Scala, you end up with lots and lots and lots of small functions that are one expression. That one expression might be several lines, like in this case. But small functions that are one expression are very, very, very easy to maintain, very easy to figure out what's going on. <coughs> All right, another basics. Use the read eval print loop. In SBT, we call it a console. In, uh, in Maven, I think they also call it a console. Some people call it an interpreter, like the IDEs and stuff. It's the same thing, right? When you are developing Scala code, go into the interpreter and play around with what you're doing. You'll get a good feel for what types of APIs you're writing, how elegant it is, what the type system is doing behind the scenes for you. <coughs> the REPL is going to print types for you. It's going to tell you what's returned from functions, right? Experiment, experiment, experiment. In Scala, this is the first level of testing, is the REPL. After that, you can start writing your tests and write your code, that sort of thing. It's a great way to learn new libraries. All right, finally, stay immutable, right? Mutable variables have a lot of things that you cannot do with them. For example, I cannot share them safely across threads, right? I have to lock. Locking is slow. I can't really hash on their attributes because they could change, right? That's, that's no good. Um, <coughs> equality is really painful with a mutable variable, right? Because it can mutate. I'm not guaranteed it's going to be the same for two objects. In fact, the equality itself could mutate the thing, right? Um, it's safe, safe to share internal state of an object if it's immutable. So I can grab pieces out of an object and share them elsewhere. How do we do this in Scala? They're called closures. If I write functions against a mutable object and I pass mutatable state over to another thread, it's the most common threading mistake with mutability in Scala. I think there was a thread about that on about ACA recently, right? Don't do it. Limit your mutability to where it makes sense, right? And then use immutability. Expose things as immutable. One thing you can do is you can actually mutate locally with a mutable variable. And you can only expose an immutable interface, right? And that actually is still thread safe, as long as the only time another thread sees the variable is the immutable interface, right? So 
avoid mutability. Don't fear it necessarily, although a healthy amount of fear is fine. Okay? All right. Finally, Cohen contravariance. You cannot make a covariant or a contravariant type that's mutable. It's impossible. Now, if you're going to cast and cheat the type system, that's fine, but expect runtime explosions later, right? You, you, you absolutely cannot. So that is why all the Scala collections generic APIs, where we want nice co and contravariance. What kind of interfaces are they? Well, the default is immutable, okay? Finally, Runar is going to give you free candy if you keep things immutable. <laughs> he looks a little surprised. <laughs> All right. So, again, using immutability doesn't mean a lack of mutation, right? I can still have local mutable state and expose things immutably to other threads, and it'll still be fine. But please do not close over immutable state. It's dangerous. Okay. Next up, use option. Don't use null, all right? <coughs> if, I, um, if I'm taking in user input for how to connect to a database, or sorry, this is, this is authenticating the user on a web, serve, web framework, right? Uh, I can, if I take in options, have my code still be nice and simple using four expressions, right? I can pull out the username from the option, pull out the password and authenticate, if possible, only if these things are there. And if they're not there, something else happens. Well, I can delay explosions, and I can use get or else to delay my explosions. I think that should have a yield, sorry. Anyway, so flat map it, and NPE is not for me, right? Let's use option to avoid null pointer exceptions. In Scala, there should be no reason to use null for a non-initialized value, right? OK. Finally, style. You'll know it when you have it, right? But we're not Java. We're not Ruby. We're not Haskell, OK? Style that I'm pulling from Java, I need to analyze what parts of this are because of random Java gotchas that don't really make sense at all in Scala, right? What parts of that style don't apply to Scala and throw those away because they're not going to help you out at all. Same with Ruby. If I'm coming from Ruby and I have Ruby style that I make use of, obviously Scala is a static language, so there's going to be different styles that we need to apply. Same with Haskell, right? Scala is not Haskell. Finally, with style, <laughs> the most important thing is you get your entire team to agree or you're going to have mismatched style, right? Personally, I, I would say find some automated tool like Scalariform that you can enforce and then just call it quits there. That's uh, usually the best way to enforce style. Otherwise, it's a constant battle and lots of bickering. And it's not really a useful conversation to writing programs, right? OK. <coughs> so that said, let's talk a little bit about style. Hey, all right. Use def for abstract members. Why do we use def for abstract members, right? Well, because def can be overridden by val, Def can be overridden by lazy val. Def can be overridden by var, right? So when I'm making an abstract class, if I don't know or care whether or not it's a val var, just use def. Default to using defs in your traits. Even if you think it's going to be a value, use a def. Why? Because I can optimize later, right? It's a decision for my implementer, not for me. Def is good enough for everyone. Annotate non-trivial return types for public methods. So you don't have to annotate return types on methods. But there's two things that this gives you, OK, by annotating them if they're public. One, it's documentation. So when I go read your code, I can figure out what's going on, especially if you're using some really, really complicated types, right? That will, will help me, as somebody else coming into the code, figure out what's going on. The second reason is, I, it limits the ability of accidentally exposing some sort of structural type or some sort of refined type that is not the abstract type I want to return. So if I have a factory method that's returning several of, of different implementations of some abstract interface, annotate with that abstract interface so you make sure that abstract interface is always returned. If you don't, you could potentially wind up with 
a common supertype that's not the abstract interface, right? Some, I might expose more details than I want to expose. So don't expose yourselves. All right. And uh, after that, we're going to switch into a little LL. Again, the talk is sort of uh, flowing. Hope you don't mind. All right. So composition can include inheritance in Scala, right? I can define a logger trait. And then I can define a companion trait called has logger, which just says that I have a logger. Notice it's a def and not a val. That way, if I want to override it in an implementation with a lazy val, I can. If I want to override it with a val, I can. It's fine. OK. Trait has awesome logger. Now I'm composing using the has awesome logger trait. I'm mixing it into a class. And I get an instance of awesome logger that is a delegate. It's, it's, it's a composition, right? So I'm using inheritance to express my composition. This is something that's completely possible in Scala. This is one of the two paradigms that we blend. If you're in OO, this can make sense. If you're in FP, that might not make sense at all. We'll see. OK. Finally, <coughs> that's, that's actually finally for OO. So, so those are some basic OO rules, right? Abstract defs and abstract members, you can compose with OO and make sure you annotate your public return types okay, to avoid exposing implementation details. Now, implicits, this is hey last year, right? Limit the scope of your implicits. I gave a talk on this last year, uh, and uh, I'm going to reiterate the same points. Okay. So your implicit scope <coughs> in Scala starts by looking at implicits defined in your current scope, explicit imports, and then wildcard imports, right? That's the shadowing rules. <coughs> if I find a type in one of those areas, I immediately succeed. And they are all kind of you know, looked at at once. So if I find more than one, I get an ambiguity. After I look at that scope, then I start looking at the parts of a type. And this is where putting implicits and companion objects can be really handy, right? I can throw implicits and companion objects and not have to explicitly import them or put them in my current scope. When you write code, put your implicits in the companion objects. Put them in the parts of the type. Because if you don't, <coughs> it's really, really, really hard for someone to come back later and override the implicit that you added. <coughs> and we can all assume that our code is perfect and pristine. But in practice, I really want to allow my users to overwrite the things that I screwed up. I don't trust myself, right? So again, let your user customize as needed. Avoid implicit views. These are overused. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Hey, so, so Daniel, just so you know, I am wearing shoes. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Anyway, avoid implicit views, right? These are the most overused thing when you first start in Scala. They are ridiculously handy. There's going to be times where you need them, but avoid them in general. There are usually a, there's usually a better mechanism that you can use instead of an implicit view. And then when you absolutely find out you need it, use it. Right? It should be the last thing in your toolbox as opposed to the first thing. And watch out for the implicit cat. OK. So. Next, <coughs> implicits are great, really, really, really great if you use implicit values. Some examples, type constraints, type traits. There's going to be a talk on type traits later. You should go listen to it. Here's a little, a little uh, helper. Well, first we'll talk about type constraints, right? OK, so if I have a generic buffer and I want to expose a to Java byte buffer method, and I only want to expose it if my generic buffer is a byte. I can use an implicit constraint there to say, is my t an instance of byte? What that's actually doing is the compiler is looking up an implicit that <coughs> has to abide by some uh, type system restrictions to say that t is byte. Yes, there's a way to do this without implicits. Is that your question? No, I'm saying you missed the parameter. Oh, I am missed. How am I missing the parameter name? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, sorry, there should be an x colon t, yeah. So here, if you saw that, there should be a parameter name there. Sorry. Sorry for that slide. Anyway, 
I, I hope that you get the idea, though. Implicits can be used to enforce type constraints, so I can have really, really, really rich APIs. And again, is that an implicit view? No. But it's on the class, and it's still safe. It's still type safe, right? OK. Um, <coughs> Oh, and, and for examples of these, you can look at the collections at library. If you've seen the flatten method, right? Flatten takes an implicit to determine if the underlying type parameter is a, a nested collection, and then it can work. So you're type safe. You're using implicits to help enforce type safety. OK, type traits. Here's an example. I'm going to find an abstract trait. I can call it encodable. And it's an encodable for type T, right? It tells me how to encode T's. So I have def encode that takes a T and returns an array of bytes. I have a decode that takes a byte buffer and gives me back a T, right? Then in object encode, because that trait might be annoying to look up and use, I define an encode method with this funny colon after the type. That is a context bound. It means there has to be a type trait available for T. So I need to be able to find on implicit scope an encodable of T, right? <coughs> and then I just implicitly look up that encodable in the implementation and call encode. So now I have an encode method that can take any generic T if there's an implicit encodable available. Well, how do I make implicit encodables available? I take a companion object for encodable, and I add defaults for stand the standard library, right? I define. Um, you know, int encodable as an implicit object that extends encodable, and I give it an implementation. And I can do the same thing with tuple encodable. The way I do it with tuple is I actually chain my implicits. I define an implicit tuple encodable of AB, right? I take in an encodable of A and encodable of B implicitly chained, and then I can design my encodable of tuples of AB. I can do the same thing with sequences. I can do the same thing with option either, right? And now I have a way of encoding generic types. And as a user, if I make a new to awesome, right? If I have some awesome domain object that I want to save, I can, in my companion objects, provide the implicit trait for how to encode it. And that will be the default one used. Now, do you know what's gorgeous about this, right? What's really gorgeous about this encodable method? If I don't like the way something is encoded, I can, in my local scope, override the implicit encodable for that type. So I can change the way things are encoded in my application if I don't like the default for some sort of optimization, right? I need to make sure I use that when I decode. But um, it's a very, very beautiful, very, very expressive thing. OK? This is, this is another way to kind of mix in behavior that's really, really, really flexible. All right. So that is type traits. Another thing, they are external to your class hierarchy, right? I'm monkey patching on existing classes. I don't control. If I need to add some behavior to the Scala standard library, this is how I do it. It's far better than implicit views. OK. Overridable car site, I separate my extractions. One class can have more than one implementation of a given type trait. Um, and finally, you can use this to denote roles in methods. So if I have a synchronized method, and I have a source and sync, and I want to synchronize things from the source to the sync, the type class, source and sync, denote the role in the method. Right? Now let's say I have a file, which is my source, or a directory, and I have a directory, which is my sync. Right? Directory will support both sources and sinks, but depending on where I put it in that method determines what role it takes. So type classes can enforce roles. And inside of this generic method with F and T, I can only pull things from from. I can't put things in there. Even though a directory implements the source and the sink type classes, because F only accepts source, I can only use F as a source. Right? So I'm enforcing roles with type classes. Beautiful, beautiful things. One of the most important things I think you should learn in Scala. All right. In the type system, you should also try to preserve specific types. I'm going to go back here. Do you notice in this synchronize, right, I can take a generic F and T and return an F of T? That's the same concept here. We want to preserve specific types 
because the type system will help us out more if it knows specifically what we want. We won't have to resort to reflection. The more we keep in the type system, the more it can do for us. An example, if I have a method that takes a collection and returns an instance of the same collection, right? It's better to actually try to preserve the original instance. This way, Scala knows if I start with a vector, I will return a vector. And it won't accidentally give me a list because it thinks it can. Because I've lost type information, right? So this is important. The other side of that coin is, if, you, uh, if you're not returning, if I'm not returning that T in the result of the method, then I don't need the type parameter. There's no reason for it, right? But if I am returning something, and I know that it could be any of a subclass of a thing, right? Make sure you annotate with a type parameter to preserve that specific type. It'll help you out in the long run. A little bit about collections. You should know them. We have a nice collections API, OK? We have traversable. Traversable is all about internal iteration. If I want a collection where the collection controls when to start and stop traversing, and he knows when it happens, that's traversable. The beautiful thing about traversable, I can have a traversable that opens a resource, pulls things in from the resource, and closes it when it's done with uh, traversing. And it's safe, because traversable knows exactly when all that happens. Right? He controls his own iteration. Iterable is when I want to let someone else control my iteration. I give them an iterator. Okay? That's also really handy. There's a lot of performance you can get from just dropping down to iterator. Um, Sequence, set, map. Hopefully those are transparent. And then we have index seek and linear seek. These are two I like to point out. Index seek is supposed to have efficient indexing. Linear seek is supposed to have efficient head tail decomposition. If you want to index, do not use a list. A list is a linear sequence. A list is for head tail decomposition. Don't use list as your default collection. If you're coming from Java, we would always type array list. And then you go to Scala and you drop the array part. Right? Oh, I'm immutable. Great. No, you're still using the wrong collection, most likely. Use vector. OK. Also, know your collections APIs, right? So this is, I, I, I just used reflection and grabbed all of the methods on sequence and printed them out. I didn't type that by hand, in case you're wondering. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of goodness there. Um, I think Paul has kept us pretty, uh, pretty happy with random things he adds that are really ridiculously useful. So almost any time I need some method, it happens to be in the collections API usually, right? Already. There's very, very rarely do I have to add anything to it. So, all right. Now, we're going to skip over to actors a little bit, OK? With actors. You want to create scheduler and failure zones. That's what actors are all about, right? Let it fail. But don't just let it fail. Control the area of failure, right? <coughs> things that are talking to the web and my internal indexing service, I want to keep those things separate, right? Not only do I want to keep them separate, I want to have a different thread pool for one versus the other. So one can't starve the other piece of my system. One of the beauties of actors is it's all about topology. It's about the topology of your system. You want to make sure when you design that topology that you pay attention to which pieces of the system could starve the others and keep them separate. Okay? Actually use different schedulers. Actually prevent one system from destroying another on that JVM or you know, send one onto one machine and one onto another, that sort of thing. But you should still have n plus 2 replication. Anyway. Same, so it's the, same, it's the same with scheduling and failure. And they might be different. You might have a different supervisor hierarchy than you have a thread pool hierarchy, right, for these zones. That's perfectly acceptable and totally reasonable. But please make sure that when one part of your system dies, the rest doesn't die. Or you're not really getting the most out of actors. Okay, dynamic topologies. Don't be afraid to have an actor change state. That's kind of what they're all about, right? Don't be afraid to instantiate new actors that 
Provide extra behavior around your actor. Don't be afraid, afraid to get rid of actors. Actors are all about dynamic topologies, expanding and moving based on what you need to do to handle the current input to your system, right? Move things around, change your topology to optimize at runtime. It's actually, that code becomes really, really simple in an actor system. Finally, just use ACA, right? ACA is pretty much the best actor system on the JVM. And that's not just because I work at TypeSafe. It's because I've actually tried to use all of them. Um, and uh, yeah, ACA is amazing, especially with the 2.0 release. Finally, we're going to talk a little tiny bit about functional programming. Okay? Functional programming has a bunch of awesome patterns from category theory. Okay? Some of them are really useful. You use them all the time. Some of them, if you're writing pure FP, you will use all the time. Not all of us are writing pure FP all the time. But I'm going to cover the ones that are actually useful, I would say, in almost all your code. Here's an example using applicative. If I have a bunch of options again, right, I can use this funny little symbol from Scala Z. You could also define your own applicative builders that don't use funny symbols, um, if you don't like funny symbols. Anyway, this is essentially taking those three options and joining them into a tuple right, that I can apply to that function. So driver manager get connection takes a username, a URL username and password. And I'm taking the, what's in the option and sending it to it and giving myself a new option. Okay? That's all that code is doing. That's a, a big simplification. The beauty of this is that it does it in parallel. So if you remember with four expressions, if I had that four expression example, if URL doesn't exist, right, then it's never ever going to look in username. Right? It's never ever going to look in password. It stops when it finds out that URL doesn't exist. So there's something in Scala Z called validation, which people love. There's something in Scala called either that we can do this with too. Um, if option is instead, or sorry, Lyft has what they call box, right? It's the same thing. If instead of an option, I have something that could be a value or an error message. This will let me group my error messages and save them for later so that when I discover there's an error state, I can print all of them to my user at the same time. Applicatives are like four expressions, but they're parallel, right? I'm doing all of these things. We're trying to make sure all of them can happen, all right? Applicatives are the parallel version of monads. And uh, you have to say that word sometime, right? Anyway, four expressions are how we express monads in Scala. Applicatives, well, you use this funny operator from Scala Z if you want to use them now. All right, now you should learn Scala Z. Why do I say that? The validation class, the applicative, these things are awesome. You can use them in lots and lots of real life code. You don't have to go crazy and pull in all of Scala Z for it to be useful in your program. Here I just threw a bunch of the funny operators of why people are scared of Scala Z, right? So if you take two concepts, apply some magic, enrich it, and then join it with love, flat map some awesome, you'll achieve harmony, right? That's what that says. Okay. And so I also just described what those operators do, right? So the little star there, by the way, is the same as this operator but I can never type it, so I had to cut and paste. Anyway, so in Scala Z, there are some useful things, right? There's some useful things we can learn from functional programming. Scala is about a blend. It's about knowing when to use OO, knowing when to use FP, joining the two together, right? <laughs> Classes, functions, methods, expressions, that's Scala. That is the beauty of Scala. It's a unifier. We're trying to blend. Okay? When you work in the blend, that's when you're achieving the optimum use of Scala. The type inferencer is going to work better for you. Um, your code is going to look very clean, right? If you go too far to one extreme, you're going to start to fight the compiler. All right? So, that is effective Scala. At the end, this, all of these concepts, if you were to uh, purchase a book called Scala in Depth, 
Um, these are all covered in far more detail in there, and I know that this was kind of a fire hose. So, to be a fun keynote, I thought maybe I would open it up to questions a little bit at the end. Um, I, yeah, so if you guys would like to ask any questions, feel free. Yes? <laughs> so the question is, will Concepts and Scala Z make it into the standard library, right? Um, I, so the answer to that is actually that we have, in, we have a Scala incubator. So if Scala Z puts things into the Scala incubator, the Scala incubator is what's meant to go into the standard library. Right now we're being very, very protective of the standard library because we want to make it binary compatible. Um, and so that's why very little has been able to make it in in the past. Yeah. Right, so the question is, with collections and preserving specific types, and I want to use, say, a map method that has all sorts of other things to pull in, um, and it's, it's kind of hard to make it preserve specific types, or, or the map method, right, where it could change the type. Um, in my book, I have an example where you aren't preserving necessarily the type you got in, you're preserving the most specific type map can return. Right? So you're preserving the most specific type that you can keep. So the reason why this is important, I don't know if you guys know this, if I have a bit set, what's a bit set? It's a set of ints. It's compressed, right? So I'm looking for byte positions and that's where I put whether or not an int exists. It's great for little enumerations to make them smaller in memory. However, if I call map on a bit set, and I call underscore two string. What does what's returned? Right, a a, uh, a set of string, no longer a bit set. It escapes. It goes to a least specific type because I can't have a bit set of strings. So that's the uniform type or return type principle in Scala. Um, if I'm going to write a method that's generic and I want to accept bit set and I want to return the most specific type with a collection, there's a little bit of overhead I have to do. And again. Um, well, I wish I had an example here. Anyway, that, that's a really good question, and it depends on what you're writing, right? So the question is, it, it, it can be overhead to write generic methods across all collections, right? There's, there's overhead involved. There's some implicit magic, a lot of type parameters. And in my day-to-day -day life, if I only need a vector all the time, why not just explicitly say vector, right? So. The response to that is, if I'm writing a method, right, or if I'm, if I'm writing my, my data access layer, right, I'm going to annotate vector because it's the most specific type, and I want to preserve that through the type system. If I'm writing a generic method that needs to go against any possible thing in the whole world that could be a collection, that's when I have to go to the extra effort to try to preserve the specific type, if I'm writing a utility library. If I'm writing my data library where I know it's a vector and I know I can just return things that are vector, then I don't have to go to any extra work because I'm still preserving the specific type. Know it's a vector, want it to be a vector and stay a vector. Um, so so there's, there's a dichotomy there, right? It depends on where you're writing the code. Am I writing a library I want everyone to be able to use or am I writing my specific domain, right? Once I'm in my domain, I should have specific types and I should just never have to worry about it. But to be able to do that, all of the generic stuff has to be able to preserve those specific types. Otherwise, you start running into problems. You start having to call, you know, two vector. I don't even know if two vector exists. Anyway, yeah. The question is: Is there going to be more attempts to use type classes in the standard library? Uh, the only two instances right now are like ordered and something else. Ordering, ordering sorry, and uh, another guy like that. Can build from happens, can build from happens to be a type class. It happens to be a very funky looking type class. So if you want to learn the type class pattern, look at ordering in the standard library. Um, yeah, so again, this goes back to the whole, we are very, being very, very cautious about what we throw in the standard library. Very, very, very cautious. So I would love to see a type class library try to go through Scala incubation. Hint, hint. I would love to see that, <laughs> right? But it has to go through the approval process and, and, and all that to make it in. And right now, I would say the, the odds of things entering the standard library um, without going through, without you having seen them as a library for a long time and work out bugs and prove that that design is viable is low. So, if you want such a thing in the standard library, that it, it needs to it needs to go through some stabilization process, right? So, existing projects that are stable that people like and don't complain about in Scala that they consider canonical, 
have a good shot of potentially making it in if, they're, if they go through incubation versus just some random untested library. So what's currently in Scala Incubator is the question. So we have Scala ARM, Scala IO. Um, I, think, I think technically anti-XML is considered in the incubator. Right. <laughs> so, so, well, well, it's at least getting proven out there. So, yeah. That's uh, right. So we. <laughs> that's the other thing, right? The um, I don't know if you saw the community extension library for Scala. That's kind of where the incubator has sort of moved. So incubator is like a place where you can add Scala projects, and then the Scala community extensions library is our way of we want to expand the standard library but we want to make sure these libraries prove themselves before making it into core. So um, I think with SBT 0.12, we'll be able to have the Scala Community Extension Library be um, built and deployed for you for every version of Scala. And that is just going to include projects that we, we consider core, fundamental in Scala. Um, Anti-XML is one, Scala IO, Scala ARM. Um, I think we're just going to pull in all the testing libraries, but I can't, I can't say for certain. There's a committee of a few people, uh, one person in EPFL, one, me, Martin, and then a few external um, contributors that decide what makes it in there and how, how that happens. So that's the community extensions library. So, so Scala X, OK, the question is, is this called Scala X? All right, Scala X and Scala Z are Scala community extension libraries that were generated by people, out, you know, not necessarily inside of the Scala project, okay? They're just libraries. Um, this, this is going to be something that's sponsored by uh, us under Scala, right? It's sponsored by EPFL, it's sponsored by TypeSafe to have a set of libraries that we consider, we would love to be in the standard library, but we want to validate them first. So th it's gonna be something different. And also it will just use the name of the original library. So again, Scala X or Scala IO, Scala ARM, anti XML. We're not going to make those libraries change to bring them in here. We're just going to be promoting them as, hey, we consider these core. We'd like to have them in the standard. Please test them more. <coughs> right? All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>